No, skepticism is awesome. It's, there you like go. A, <laughs> it's a superpower. It's like you can see the matrix code. So this is JT. He's Hi. going to talk about coming out skeptical, because I guess he's done that already. Have you? Yes, very much so. All right. Well, then, do, tell people about yourself, so okay. then you can, so people know why you, they should listen to you. Um, I'm a Leo. I enjoy walks on the beach. <laughs> Which um, moon phase were you born <laughs> under? You know, I don't know. I'm an astro astronomy nut, and I don't know. Um, well, before I go, how many people here are tabletop gamers? D&D? Like &D? Okay. okay, good. A fair amount has crossed over. Okay, hand, hands up if you like Pathfinder. Hands up if you like 4th edition Dungeons and Dragons. Okay, it's about even. Okay, I'm not going to tell where my preference lies. Um, okay, uh, coming out skeptical. I uh, first gave this talk in Des Moines uh, in April at the American Atheist Convention. Um, and I added a subtitle to it because I had seen Greta Christina, Jen McCrite, Dave Silverman, PZ Myers all speak before me. And that subtitle was, Why PZ Myers, Greta Christina, and Dave Silverman are all not aggressive enough. Which is kind of like saying the sun isn't big enough. Um, but I'm at Dragon Con now, so I, I, I changed it up. Why Drists, Orcish Barbarians, and PZ Myers, who is often indistinguishable from Orcish Barbarians, are not aggressive enough. <laughs> Um, like you said, my name is J.T. Eberhard. I work for the Secular Student Alliance, and we're presently winning at atheism. Um, the Secular Student Alliance is an organization that supports college and high school skeptic groups uh, at, about, at, a, at about exactly 276 uh, college locations across the United States. Um, this, is, this is our campus organizing team. It's pretty much how we spend all our days. It's my game face. Um, oh, this is also us. Whenever we get the atheists eat babies kind of emails coming in, we just send them this image back. Um, this is our national convention this year. Um, how many of you remember back when PZ Myers took the big Zerg to the Creation Museum? Anybody that old? Okay, a few people. Um, that, he did that that year for our, for our national convention, and we had 112 people attend that summer. And it was our biggest national convention. I think it might have been the biggest... Uh, student leader national convention ever between us and CFI. This year we had about 240 people. So youth atheism is definitely on the rise. The Secular Student Alliance is right in the middle of it. Um, the 274, uh, I put this slide together last week. It's actually now 276, um, which is, should suggest to you the rate we're growing. Um, and this exponential spike is pretty much how it's been going for the last few years. Um, we also just started an alumni program. So for those of you who have been a part of student groups and want to keep up with your secular activism, the Secular Student Alliance is going to continue to support uh, those people, or even the people who never went to college, as they get into community groups and as they uh, start working for secularism in the world at large. OK. So why are we here? Why am I here? I'm, this is pretty much how we look. Um, I'm here because, on a very serious note, religion destroys lives. People lose their jobs because of their inability to accept that Jesus died, rose from the dead. Children are ostracized from their home. How many of you read the Damon Fowler story early, earlier this year and followed that? I mean, these things are not terribly uncommon. And it makes perfect sense when, once you accept certain presuppositions about the operation of the universe. Uh, for instance, imagine we have a thief, someone who's burglarized 40 homes. Now this person has, uh, has uh, dumped considerable inconvenience and unhappiness onto 40 families. If the word bad is to have any meaningful definition, this guy is it. But how much worse is someone who has the potential or someone like you know, me and a lot of you, who actually goes out and actively tries to rip people away from eternal paradise and convict them to eternal suffering. I mean, if something like that is true, we're worse than thieves. We're worse than all manner of criminals. So it shouldn't really surprise us, as atheists, when we see this manifesting itself in a variety of different ways. 
raw or scary. Um, in Des Moines, when I gave this talk, this was one of the guys sitting out front. Uh, God loves everyone, even atheists. I mean, there's, there's a, a none too subtle implication here. God loves all those people who deserve it and also those assholes, <laughs> even atheists. And this is something we laugh about. It's something we shrug off, but it's not really something we should because there are a, a just litany of social consequences for this. Um, if you go to the about.com website and go to their atheism page, this is the first thing you're going to see. The most recent data shows that atheists are more distrusted and despised than any other minority, and that an atheist is the least likely person that Americans would vote for in a presidential election. It's a, not, update. Update. The tea Party is more despised. Than us? <laughs> I never thought I'd be jealous of the Tea Party. Second most, it's not just that atheists are hated, though apparently less than the Tea Party, woo! But also that atheists seem to represent everything about modernity which Americans dislike or fear. And I'm pretty sure we don't need an update on that one. We all know that one's pretty spot on. Um, and I'm the high school organizer at the Secular Student Alliance, so I'm going to tell you a story um, that I came across earlier this year that I feel really uh, captures that point. The guy on your screen right here, is, his name is Brian Lisko. He goes to Stephen F. Austin High School in Texas. And I got this job in January. For eight months before I got this job, he was trying to set up a secular club at his high school down in Texas. And for eight months, he had just been pretty much completely ignored by his administration, with one exception. At one point, his administrators told him that he could have the club if only he called it a philosophy club and didn't affiliate with the Secular Student Alliance. Now, who here wants to lose money and bet me that Campus Crusade for Christ or Ignite or Fellowship of Christian Athletes got asked to be a philosophy club or got asked not to affiliate with their national headquarters? This is not uncommon. In fact, this is the scenario that arises more often than not with high schoolers just wanting the exact same rights as the other students at their school. Um, and I tell the story because it has a happy ending to it. Um, when I, once I got the job, I called up to his administrators, asked what the deal was, uh, got ignored, got stonewalled, and I did everything up to threaten to sue them into oblivion, um, to no avail. But USA Today got wind of this story. So they started calling up the administrators and saying, hey, we're doing this story. Can you send us a quote about it? And they did this day in and day out for five days. Got ignored the first day, got ignored the second day, ignored the third day, ignored the fourth day. But on the fifth day, saith the Lord, <laughs> they got a one-sentence response from, uh, from the school. He can have his club. Now that underscores uh, something very important about the way these situations tend to get handled. Why the 180? Why change positions just as soon as there is accountability, as soon as there's the thought that a nation of people are going to be watching? Because if you believe you're in the right, why not stay in and fight the good fight? Why change positions? There's really no other motivation to change there unless these administrators know that what they're doing is either illegal or wrong, and they just don't care. It's one of the things I'm most proud of about my position, because it's my job to make them care. I'm going to throw some data up here for you real quick, which will explain to you why we're second most despised up against the Tea Party. Uh, which group does not at all agree with my vision for American society? 39.6% say atheists. I would disapprove if my child wanted to marry a member of this group. Almost half. And this contributes to you know, the stories like Brian Lisko, the fact that we're so despised, contribute to an environment that makes it very, very difficult for people to come out of the closet, to just be themselves. Uh, and I think this is the single most important thing we can do for the atheist movement, and I'm going to explain why. Uh, and we're going to focus on what has worked for other groups. 
and we all know uh, one of our best allies in the, in the quest for equality is the gay rights movement, the LGBT movement. Uh, the bottom green line over here represents uh, the people who believe that, homosexual, uh, that homosexuality is morally acceptable. And just in 2010, for the first time, that got to be more than half the country. It's a huge victory for them. Now, this green line, if you were to extrapolate it back beyond where this chart stops, and just to think that it keeps going downward, you would be 100% correct. LGBT people have come from a position of extreme, uh, of being extremely disliked, of being feared, and are finally getting to a point where they can come out of the closet without fear of being beaten, without fear of losing their jobs, which is exactly what we're looking to do. And how have they done it? They've done it through decades of activism to a point now where they've fostered an environment where LGBT people can feel almost safe or even comfortable coming out of the closet. And what this means is that for most Americans, for the first time, they're waking up to the idea that not only do they know gay people, but that they like gay people. And this is changing the perception for everybody and allowing LGBT people to become more integrated into American culture. And this is exactly the way it can be for us. Finding out that someone you love, your brother, your sister, your friend, is atheist or gay changes everything. And it allows the arguments for, the, for equality to really percolate in your mind. And to give you an example of that, I'm going to tell you the story here about uh, Louis Marinelli. How many of you guys are familiar with the National Organization for, for Marriage? You know, there's a storm coming. Rawr. The gay people are out to destroy America. Uh, th this is, I mean, they are fiercely this way. Um, Louis Marinelli was an employee of theirs. He managed uh, a lot of their on, most of their online relations. Uh, it was his idea for the NOM national tour. Nom, 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 nom. <laughs> uh, he drove the bus. He was a huge part of this. And he, no long, he dedicated his life to no, 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 no LGBT marriage. Um, and he no longer holds that position. And he blogged about this and why, how he got to that point. And he wrote, even though I had been confronted by the counter-protesters throughout the marriage tour, the lesbian and gay people whom I'd made a profession out of opposing became real people for me almost instantly. For the first time, I had empathy for them and remember asking myself what I was doing. Finding out that someone close to you is what you think you despise can soften the hardest hearts and it can, ch it can change uh, the most closed of minds. If it can do it for him, it can do it for us. So what that means is, if we're going to create the environment we want for the next generation, those of us who are already out of the closet need to start doing the legwork. And we need to start doing it more overtly. I mean, if you're an LGBT person, you may be tempted to drop hints. You know, you may want to come out and just say, I'm gay. You may want to say things like, Justin Timberlake's a really good singer, don't you think? <laughs> and see where that takes you. Likewise, for atheists, we may want to say to our Christian friends, I got hot linked to this biologist's blog, and he uses arguments X, Y, and Z. How would you go about refuting those? We shouldn't be subtle about it. We should shout it from the mountaintops. We should, anytime someone asks us, what is your religious affiliation, we should be honest about it. Not in your face, not I'm an atheist and you suck. I'm an atheist, period. I'm a good person. But I don't think we should stop there. While I want an environment where atheists can feel safe coming out of the closet, where we don't feel like we'll lose our jobs or, or, or have our property destroyed in some manner, I think religion is the only institution that repeatedly tells us that it's OK to be unreasonable. And I think there are a host of consequences for the promulgation of that idea. Um, first off, I think we need to accept that we are not advocates of atheism, which sounds really lame because I'm giving a talk why you should come out as atheists, but we're not advocates of atheism. Atheism is a conclusion. I mean, let evangelicals be the one peddling a conclusion. I mean, that is the story of, e of evangelical Christianity. You need to accept our arbitrary beliefs and our arbitrary set of rules because some arbitrary being has decreed it an arbitrary being you can't talk to, you can't even question, and that's why you should accept our conclusions. 
I'm a big fan of atheism, so I think atheism is better than that. Our position is that if you will only be reasonable, you'll get to our conclusion all by yourself. And so that's what we should be telling people. Be reasonable. If you find an Aladdin's lamp lying in the sand sometime in the next month, don't wish for everybody to be an atheist. Wish for everybody to be reasonable. Because reason is our lifeblood. It's, it touches everything we do. In fact, it's the very basis for morality. Those of you who read the blogs know that several times a year, sometimes a couple times a month, some parents have a child with an easily curable illness, something that could be cured with an extremely cheap pill. But those parents don't take their children to the hospital. They pray and they pray and they pray until they have successfully prayed their child to death. These parents are the very definition of evil. And they murdered their, chi their child. This is as bad as it gets for, mo for most people. But there's something very important to note there, is that these parents loved their children as much as any of us would love our children. They wanted their children to get better, just like any of us would want their children to get better. Their intentions were no different from anybody in this room. But having good intentions is not what makes you a good person. And that is why reason, or unreason, is the enemy of humankind and our well-being. It's the enemy of the flourishing of our species. It takes our good intentions and it corrupts them. Not every time, but it very much can. It's like Steve Weinberg said, it's the reason good people do bad things, because of irrationality. This is why every single human being has a moral obligation, not only to themselves, but to every other teammate they have here on Earth, to be reasonable, to make sure that their good intentions are realized in the beneficial effects they want. And it's my opinion that this is a responsibility that every single religious person fails. And it's something we should start holding them accountable for. Now, actually, let me go back real quick. We live in a world where we're sundered into different communities morally. Everybody wants to say politically, I know what is moral. And this is how we should legislate. This is how we should expect people to live. And there are several different communities like this. And a problem we have is everybody wants to say, I'm right morally. But nobody wants to say, I'm right about the nature of the universe. Very few people I'm finding want to say, you're wrong about God, therefore all of your moral conclusions don't follow. And because nobody's willing to have the discussion about what is real about the universe, we wind up paralyzed in our moral discourse, just frozen into disagreement. And this is something that's not going to get fixed until we start acclimating people to the idea that it's okay to have those conversations. That we can talk about why we do or do not believe in God uh, in a very meaningful manner. Another thing about the world we live in is that threats to the well-being of atheists have been reduced to commonalities in all but the minds of the most severe skeptics. For instance, if someone walked up to you and said, believe as I believe, or a friend of mine is going to find you and punch you squarely in the face, I mean, that person, if you call the police, may have just bought your next car for threatening you. But if someone walks up to us and says, believe as I believe, or my friend's going to find you and light you on fire for all of eternity, at best we shrug it off, and at worst we think that person has just done us a favor and expressed you know, some uh, modicum of care or love for us. And that's ass backwards. That needs to be changed, and it's something we need to talk about whenever they tell us, I love you, if you don't believe me, this is what's going to happen. It's something we should start doing a lot more often. Okay, now there are all kinds of ways that religious people, and sometimes even skeptics, find to avoid having these conversations. Why do you talk about religion so much? You'll never change anybody's mind. We'll just have to agree to disagree. We should respect everybody. And my beliefs are different. Why do you talk about religion so much? You'll never change anybody's mind. Raise your hand if you think you know the fastest growing 
religious demographic in the United States? Everybody at once, what is it? Atheism. Atheism. Or non-belief. Or, non <laughs> or unaffiliated, yes. We, we have a whole, brights, we're brights. Um, but we are growing fastly. We are changing people's mind. How many people in here, raise your hand if you are an atheist or a humanist or a non, okay, good, since yeah, that's the name. Leave your hand in the air. Now, leave your hand in the air if you were once a religious person. Most of us. Now, leave your hand in the air if part of you getting away from being a religious person was an argument someone made or, or helped get you away from it. Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, any books you read, right? Look around the room and see whose hands are still up. I mean, this is not an insignificant number. I gave this talk um, in Des Moines, and it was something like 60% of the audience still had their hand in the air. Arguments do change minds. They have to. Religion will give us this idea, Christianity specifically, that we have to choose to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And that's impossible. Because we don't choose our beliefs. Our beliefs are a function of what information is rattling around our brain, and it generates that model of reality despite what we want. And if you don't think this is the case, try climbing up to the top of this hotel, walking up to the edge, and, change, and just convincing yourself by force of will that gravity doesn't work. And there's not a single person in this room that could do that. Our beliefs are made up for us given what information is in our skull. We just have to try and get this information into the heads of religious people. And we can't do that unless we're talking about it. So why do I talk about religion so much? I'll never change anybody's mind. Because it does change people's minds. It works. And frankly, because it would be immoral for me not to. We'll have to agree to disagree. I want to vomit blood every time I hear someone say this. <laughs> I mean, clearly I agree that we're in disagreement, otherwise we couldn't be having an argument. But that's not what people mean when they say this. So often this is a euphemism for, I need to be allowed to keep believing the things I believe without contest. And we can't allow that. Remember what I said before, we can't agree morally until we agree on the nature of the universe, on the facts that drive our moral conclusions. If we want a world where we're truly inclusive of all cultures, where we can actually really coexist, we have to do it through reason. And we can't do that as long as we're agreeing to disagree. If we agree to disagree about the nature of God, we're also agreeing to disagree about politics, about morality. And if we're ever going to reconcile those differences, when someone says we'll have to agree to disagree, our answer needs to be a resounding no. We may continue to disagree, but the conversation cannot stop. Dum de dum dum dum. We should respect everybody. Maybe. But a lot of the people that say this have a very finicky definition of respect. A lot of people when they say we need should respect everybody, expect us to placate others and to treat them like they're they can't handle a little mild criticism about their beliefs. And that's not respect. That's condescension. Nobody should want that. I mean, if I respect an atheist I disagree with, the very first thing I'm going to do is apprise that atheist to why I disagree with him. And I clearly respect uh, theists as much as I respect atheists. Believe me on this. Um, so when, when someone tells you we should respect everybody, correct their definition of respect. Um, but something they'll also do is they'll try to extend this uh, idea of universal respect to say that we should also respect all ideas which is flagrantly wrong offensively wrong I mean we live in a world of unbridled comforts I mean take anybody from a previous generation and ours would appear to them as a utopia because we have kept the good ideas and profoundly disrespected the bad ideas some ideas do not deserve respect and we should be eager to say that. We should be eager to apply the informal social controls that keep most of us from espousing an opinion that we've not thought through. Our goal isn't just to change minds, but it's to cultivate an atmosphere that is conducive to reason and conducive to the flourishing of the human spirit. And that can't happen as long as we're respecting every idea. My beliefs are different. The, uh, 
World Christian Encyclopedia says there's 34,000 different sects of Christianity in the United States alone. So when someone says, you know, my beliefs, those aren't true Christians, my beliefs are different. They're probably right, their beliefs are different. But one way in which I think all religious people are similar is that they all have the same bad reasons for believing the things they do. I mean, the liberal Christian has no better reason to believe they're privy to the will of God than Fred Phelps. Their beliefs may be less malicious, but they're no more likely to be true. And if we're treating our beliefs like they're important, like people have a moral obligation to be reasonable, that's a distinction that, that we should make and that we should hold accountable peop people to, not only so that their own good intentions produce the beneficial results they want, but also because we're their teammates down here on earth. And if we want a happy society, we need to start holding people accountable to being reasonable, not just different from the people who have malicious beliefs. But won't it make people stop listening if they're offended? Maybe. I mean, nobody was ever offended by an unspoken argument, so if we keep our mouths shut, we'll be sure to not offend anybody. Um, but what does offend people about atheism? Um, I'm an organizer for the Secular Student Alliance. We helped uh, support Ask an Atheist Day on April 13th of this year. And at Larkin High School, they had a table set up. Come, you know, just come ask us about atheism. We're just here to answer questions. I mean, there is not a less offensive way to go about spreading the idea of atheism, and we still get quotations like this in the newspapers. They were here to talk about atheism, said Siobhan Stanback of Elgin which sounds kind of like an RP name, Siobhan Stanback of Elgin. <laughs> That's totally unacceptable to me. I'm a Christian woman. I believe in God. I believe in heaven and hell. Offended by what? That we exist? That we're answering questions about what it means to be an atheist? And we all know that the offense comes up at the very notion that atheists are out there. You follow the atheist billboards. Don't believe in God. You're not alone. Completely innocent, completely innocuous idea that atheists are out there and they're vandalized and people are offended about it. Are you good without God? Millions are. A completely self-evident fact that atheists can be moral people and yet if you read the reactions to this, you see grown men and women positively losing their shit over this. <laughs> if we're going to wait for people to not be offended to talk about atheism, we're going to be waiting a very long time. We cannot let the barrier of offense keep us from talking about what we are. Now, I'm not asking everybody to go out and be this guy. Because <laughs> this guy is not holding anybody accountable to being reasonable. He's, he's just out to offend, right? Okay divine? Before that? divine? <laughs> I'll pray on it. <laughs> now, if we're, if we're in the process of trying to accomplish a more noble goal, to hold people accountable for being reasonable, or, or just you know, saying that atheists are out there and people get offended by that, fine. They're getting offended while we're on the way to doing something else. But we shouldn't go out just to offend people. That, that's something that will turn people away. Um, and if you, think, if you think that the people espousing reason and saying that atheists are okay, that we can be moral, are somehow on the same playing field as this guy, I have two words for you. I disagree. <laughs> strongly, very strongly, and with language that may be inappropriate for mixed company. So, will people stop listening if they're offended? How many of you know who PZ Myers is? Almost everybody. You will not find someone who delights more in offending religious people than PZ Myers. You know which blogger probably gets the most email and comments from religious people? PZ Myers. <laughs> and it makes sense. If we assault territory occupied by religion, they have really two options, to either defend themselves or to concede the ground. And let me tell you something about religion. They're very bad about conceding ground without a fight. So of course they're going to engage us. PZ is perfect evidence of that. Greta Christina gets these emails. Jen McCrite gets these emails. I get these emails. Most of the prominent atheist bloggers do get these emails. But you know what emails we also get? We get emails from people saying, you've changed my mind. And not just about things like atheists can be, a good, can be good people or that evolution is true. Or, you know, we, we get them sending us emails saying, you've changed my mind about Jesus rising from the dead, about whether or not there is a God. So if you think that people are going to stop listening because they're offended or that they won't even change their mind because they're offended, 
No, you're dead wrong. What's next? Oh, yeah, I put a story in here. Uh, uh, for, that, for that Ask an Atheist Day I was talking about earlier, I was on a panel at Ohio State University with the SSA's development director, Ashley Paramore. And one of the questions from the audience was to Ashley, because she travels all the time, and it was, um, how do you deal in airports when people ask you what you do for a living? And Ashley said, you know, she, she danced around it. Uh, she said, well, I work for a not-for-profit. Oh, which not-for-profit? Well, I fundraise for my not-for-profit. Oh, which not-for-profit? Yeah, I know, one in Ohio. Um, until 20 minutes left in the airplane ride, at which point, you know, then she'll say what she does, because she just doesn't want to endure the three-hour headache. And then they asked me the same question, because I travel and speak a lot. How do you deal with people asking you what you do for a living in, on an airplane? And I said, once they open the door to talking about what I do for a living, I walk through just as far as I want, because I know they can't get away from me for three hours. <laughs> but we wouldn't have to worry about the three-hour fucking headache if more people did that, if more people would just talk about it. Um, and it's a, good w it's a good way to bring atheism into the, into the foresight of the public. <clears throat> One of the main reasons the civil rights movement was so effective, and continues to be so effective, is because that was about the time that every American family had a TV in their homes. And so every night they would have dinner around the TV, and they would see the riots. They would see the marches. You couldn't go a day without having the civil rights concept uh, be brought to the forefront of your attention. And it worked for them because their position was the most rational. So as long as people were thinking about it, they were winning. And so it can be for us. There's so much sensationalism surrounding atheism right now that we have a real chance to bring this uh, into the sight of just about every American every day. Another good thing about this is because when there's public accountability, it makes it harder for people to be unreasonable. How many of you, raise your hands, have had that religious friend that says, come get coffee with me and let's talk philosophy? One-on-one, -on -one, you and me, friends. How many of you also realize that once you get into a, a very private space, that the religious person can often become a skipping CD of, nah uh nah uh nah uh nah uh nah uh God, I've done this a lot. Which is why I developed a policy. From now on, whenever, when anybody asks me, come get coffee somewhere private and let's talk about religion, I always say, okay, but I'm going to film it and put it unedited on my blog. <laughs> their, console, their concern for my everlasting soul drives, drives up real fucking quick at that point. <laughs> I suddenly need a lot less saving when that's on the table. And you can even watch it happen you know, when you're having a discussion with a group instead of one-on-one, -on -one, where they go to say, nah uh and think, crap, people are watching. I actually have to try and make sense. As long as it's in the public, as long as there's eyes on it, as long as there's accountability, we're winning. So start doing this. When someone says, we want to talk about God, fine. Let's talk about it in a group. Or let's film it and put it unedited on a blog. As long as there's eyes on this subject, we're winning. Any day a pastor goes the entire day without thinking about atheism is a, is a day we have failed. And it's a day we didn't have to fail. Which means you also need to be prepared. <laughs> yeah, one person has seen The Lion King. Awesome. <laughs> when you start coming out of the closet proudly as an atheist, proudly as a rationalist, you're going to get a series of arguments. You're going to need to be prepared to answer. You're going to need to know how to refute Pascal's wager. Again and again and again. You're going to need to know how to refute the first cause argument. Which means you know, we're going to have to read. We're going to have to abide by that moral responsibility we have to be reasonable, to know why we believe the things about the world we do. It's not hard. And our position is the most well-supported out of any position out there. You know, it's like walking into a race knowing you're going to win. Um, I totally forget why I have this slide in here. So we're going to go past it. <laughs> Mockery is the last thing I want to talk about. Um, <laughs> we have a firebrand. Uh, so mad. Um, there's a lot of people who will say that it's wrong to mock ideas. Um, and I don't think that's the case. Mockery, uh, it's a double-edged sword. 
if you mock a position that is inherently defensible, you're about to look really stupid. Because that person's going to dump a bunch of evidence on you. It's going to show that you are more confident than you should have been and that you're wrong. And it's going to cost you. If you walk up to someone and say, yeah, the earth is round, where'd you get that one? That person's about to make you look like an idiot. All right? So we need to be sure that we're mocking appropriately. Because when we mock appropriately and there's no response, we do something very important. Religions are predicated on their ability to be taken seriously just out of hand. That there's some uh, obligatory respect that should be paid to them. It's their lifeblood. We take it away by taking them less seriously. And that includes mockery. And it doesn't necessarily make us the villain. People watch Stephen Colbert and Jon Stewart all the freaking time because they mock appropriately. And they mock with facts and information and reason on their side. We shouldn't mock for the sake of mocking. But we shouldn't feel bad about doing it when someone's advancing a ridiculous position. There's power in mocking bad ideas. This is one last quote from Louis Marinelli, the guy I told you about earlier from nom 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 nom. One article I wrote towards the end of October 2010 caught the attention of a blogger by the name of RJ, who writes in the blog, Am I Working? He responded to my article about the homosexual agenda with an article addressed personally to me regarding marriage equality. In short, his article had the miraculous effect of instantly putting things into perspective for me. It's like I said before, if his mind can be changed, anybody's can. The problem is, we don't want to put up with the headache. We don't want to sit there and, and just dredge through a bunch of bad arguments. We just want to live in peace, which is fine. But you have to be able to live in peace knowing that out there, high schoolers are getting beat up for being atheists. People are losing their job for being atheists. And children are being ostracized from their homes for being atheists. We have the power to start changing that starting right now. We can create the atmosphere for the next generation that we wish we lived in. But we have to start putting up with the headache. We have to start talking to people about atheism, about what we are. And we have to start giving them the chance to love us as we really are by being honest with them. And it sucks. I, I know it sucks. So many of us have so much to lose personally, professionally, by being honest about what we are. I don't think anybody wants to come up here and, and tell anybody that in order to create a better world, we have to invite hate. But we do. We really, really do. Every single social movement thus far has started out being hated. Women's suffrage, hated. Civil rights movement, hated. And they're going to hate us. And boy, howdy, are they going to hate us. And they do hate us. I mean, less than the Tea Party, I guess. <laughs> but it's not going to get better until that comes to a head. And I think we should start doing it right now. We should take that burden away from the next generation and start coming out as rationalists. Start treating everyone's beliefs not like they matter. Not just ours, but the beliefs of everyone else. And we should start holding people accountable for being unreasonable. That's how we create the world that we want. We just got to be able to put up with the headache. I'm a huge fan of quotes. One of my favorite quotes ever is uh, Winston Churchill. You have enemies. Good. You've stood up for something in your life. We shouldn't invite enemies just for the sake of having enemies. But we need to realize we're going to have some of them on the, on the road to equality. And we need to be okay with that. And we need to realize for everybody, including ourselves, that it's far better to be hated for who you are than loved for who you aren't. Thank you guys very much for giving me the time. I appreciate it. And if you do support the work the Secular Student Alliance is doing, um, those of you who have been students know that students are pretty much broke all the time, kind of like adults who work in the atheist movement. Uh, but for, yeah, for the student movement to thrive, it takes the support of non-students. Uh, the Secular Student Alliance table is just off this way. I'll be there every morning. It'll be there. Uh, it'll be staffed all day, every day. Go make a donation, even if it's only five bucks. The next generation, uh, 
is going to be the leaders of American atheists. They're going to be the, the next executive director of the Secular Coalition for America. They're going to be the next people in charge of the American Humanist Association. And this is one of the only organizations you can give to that really touches all of them. And it's important. Become a member for a year. It costs 35 bucks. Buy one less coffee or something. Just hand us some money. It makes a huge difference. Um, I'm JT Everhard. This is all my contact information. If you need help coming out of the closet, if you need support, I'm here to help you. Call me. Email me. Don't hesitate and don't feel like you're a burden. It's my job, and even if it wasn't, it's something I'd be tickled to do for the rest of my life. Now I'll take questions. Awesome. <laughs> By the, by the by, you guys know that Felicia Day is off in the Whedon Universe room right now, right? Along with a bunch of the cast of Buffy. And also, uh, D &D, the Wizards of the Coast is having their four, four, uh, fourth edition talk right now. Ew. Don't rub it in. Uh, I know. Like, all of you people here, if you knew that, I'm flattered, and otherwise you made a terrible mistake. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, I'm flattered, but I think most people are just in error. All right. I've been out on Facebook for probably about two or three years, but oh, I man. don't have much contact with my family. And I got to spend time with my father a couple days ago. And he blames himself for me being an atheist, and I don't know how to deal with it. <laughs> No, it's all right. This goes back to what I said. There are a lot of people have a great deal personally to lose from being honest about what they are. I was very lucky. I grew up in a secular family, so I have no idea what to tell you. Except that it seems to me the best thing you can do is be honest. Tell him it wasn't his fault, but not only that it wasn't his fault, but that you're happy, that your life is better this way. Is there a book? or something that I can show him that like, says, okay, this was what present, was presented to me and, and this is how, through rationalism, I became a non-believer? There are a lot of books out there that do that eloquently. Uh, none of them will do it as effectively as you talking to him yourself and telling him what changed your mind. Okay, so my life is gonna suck for a while, huh? <laughs> Yeah, but don't think that it sucks emptily. So many times when we tell people that we're atheists, it doesn't change their opinion about us, it changes their opinion about atheism. It's and you're easy, likely... It's easy to hate something that you don't understand. It's easy to hate something you don't understand. Thank you. No um, problem. I'm sorry, I just wanted to, to speak to her because I have... Um, I can understand where she's coming from. I have my mother and my grandmother are both, both ordained ministers, and my father is very active in his church as well. And I had this kind of conversation with my father. It was a little bit more joking than I think yours was. But what I told him when he asked me, basically, you know, where did we go wrong with you? And I'm like, you know, you taught me how to think. I'm sorry, you did a good job. <laughs> and, you know, even though we, we, you know, I'm able to engage my, my parents in constantly in this conversation. I just keep going back to that point where you raised me right. You raised me to have a brain. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, right, this is, this is where I came to. And, you know, it doesn't mean that I hate you or anything. It's just, you know, and so just keep having that dialogue. With them. Maria, if doing, if doing the right thing were easy, every single person on this planet would be in shape, we'd all have PhDs, and the world would be full of good people. <laughs> It's just an, an un, unfortunate fact about the nature of the universe. But it takes a lot of bravery to do what you did. You guys should give her a round of applause. She deserves it. <laughs> oh boy, another question. <laughs> when I saw your slide of the uh, family sitting around the TV, um, it occurred to me that I'm, I'm amazed that there's a top-rated show called Bones in which the lead character is... Mm -hmm. Clearly, though, perhaps not openly atheist. Mm -hmm. And what, what do you think happened that, because uh, 10, 15 years ago, it would just been unthinkable for even, her to even doubt her partner mm -hmm. the way she does. What happened in the interim that allowed a, a show to have that and to be accepted um, by the majority of the people? Social scientists will tell you that for an idea to catch on and, and to grow into a mainstream idea, that the tipping point is about 10% of the population. 
and we hit 10% of the population, where people can feel like they can start appealing to us and be okay about it. Um, I don't think we're ready for uh, just overt atheism. We're ready for overt critical thinking and people who are atheists on the side, the Dr. House, the Bones. Um, but uh, Matthew Chapman's movie, The Ledge, you know, has an overt atheist, and I think there is a, a somewhat negative reaction to that publicly. So I don't think we're quite ready for that point yet, but what got us to that point? Growth. Winning. Well, also, like, as Charlie Sheen would say. <laughs> also, um, Kathy Reichs, who actually is the person who they created Tempest Brennan, the main mm -hmm. character of Bones, they're based on her books, which is actually her. It's the, the, right. I mean, those, those shows are kind of factual. And her books were number one sellers, and then she pitched the idea, but she said, it has to be me. You can't screw it up. It has to be my words and how I think. And they gave it a shot. It was a chop rated show, and it just keeps going. And she had control of that first initial thing. It's like, you want to have my books? And she put her foot down. She said, you, my character is this way, I'm this way. You have to present me like me. So she kind of did that. And, and, and props to uh, Emily Deschanel for embracing that and not at all backing away from it. Right on. It's weird as Fox because they usually screw everything up. <laughs> <laughs> I want to give a huge kudos to the, to the people asking questions so far. Um, I have a real aversion to people who ask questions without a question mark at the end during Q&As. And so far, everybody's keep being very considerate, keeping it nice and concise, and realizing there's other people asking questions. So keep that up. Go ahead. On the subject of... Uh, TV shows with a uh, skeptic or an atheist as a uh, as a character or as a main character. One of the things I despise the most is uh, what I like to call Full Metal Alchemist Syndrome, where the main character in the very beginning states, I'm an atheist, and then a different producer comes along, and then things start getting fuzzy. And then the fan base is basically split on it. I like it whenever it's cohesive. Okay. My question is, um, I have a perfect example of this. I have two friends. Uh, I love these friends. They're both really great people. And I, th these are the only two people that I will not talk about religion to. And that's because of this stigma against talking about it. Mm -hmm. I know that I should. But at the same time, I'm, I'm sitting here in the back of my mind. And I'm just going, I really shouldn't because I really, want, I really value their friendship. They know I'm an atheist at, 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 in so many ways. And right before our trip to Dragon Con, uh, one of them said uh, it's like it's a family tradition, you know, to say the Lord's Prayer right before a road trip. His mom is standing right next to him, and I just politely just backed off, and I didn't, yeah. I wasn't a part of it. So, what is your question? My question is, how should I'm sorry, I'm a dumbass. Remember that talk I just gave before you hit the microphone? Yep, <laughs> yep, just remembered it. Okay. Um, how do people deal with friends that? They're not so overtly Christian that it's, it bothers people, or at least it bothers them, but how do we deal with friends uh, who are Two things that I situation? would say to that. Uh, the first one is, um, if you agree with my talk, that, that we don't take reason quite seriously enough, um, then you do them the courtesy of giving them the chance to love you as you truly are, and if they don't, how good of friends are they? And I hate saying that about your friends, but... I mean, I've never understood the, the desire to give people an impression of something you're not in order to be liked. It, it seems manufactured. Mm -hmm. I guess that's all I really do have to say about that. Thank you. No problem. Thanks for the question. Hello. Hello. My name is Patricia. And I'm JT. I'm sorry? I'm JT. Nice Ooh. to meet you, JT. Likewise. Everybody thinks they're right. The Christians think they're right. Mm -hmm. We think we're right. Everybody thinks they're right. Mm -hmm. If I were to have watched this um, talk and replaced the word atheist with Christian, I would have been scared to death because it sounded like a crusade was being started. I live my life as an atheist in the concept that I don't want religion to be any factor in any of my life or affect me in any way. So I don't go on a crusade to put forth my opinion about it, although I understand the reasons why we should for reasons, but again, everybody thinks they're right. So I guess my question is, how do you feel about the atheist living their life in a way of completely cutting out religion out of their life versus trying to go on this movement of us being right and convincing everybody else they're wrong? Um, 
God, it's, it's so weird. I, I hear that word so often, crusade, when applied to atheism. When what I just stood up here and advocated was talking. Um, <laughs> being reasonable and, and telling people when we think they're being unreasonable. And it's not like I don't expect that back from the religious side. Uh, I want, uh, we get this so often from religious people. How would you feel if I went around making fun of atheism all the time? Do it. Mm. Try to do it. Uh, but it goes back to what I said about mockery. You know, uh, our, our position, I, I would say, is defensible. And of course, Christians will say the same thing. But so long as we're talking about it, we're working it out, and we at least have the chance to reconcile our moral differences. So as far as just cutting religion out, but not being a fan of the conversation, um, it, it goes back to what I said in the talk. You can do that, but realize that the fact that we're not having the conversation, and the people unwilling to have con the conversation, um, are allowing us to kind of stagnate in a, in a place that, that uh, feeds into this societal norm where atheists are despised. Um, so if you, if you really want to make the world a better place for those around you and the, and the atheists you love, or even the atheists you don't love, you need to. Uh, and if you're not, you know, fine, if that's what makes you happy, that's all we can ask of anybody in life. It doesn't make you a bad person. But that's what I would say to that. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay, thank you, Patricia. Thank you. This is Margaret Downey. I love your work, and Thank I'm so you. happy I got to meet you today. Thank, Thank you, so, you much. so much. Um, I actually wanted to start my little question with a very deep compliment. You give me hope for the future, JT. Can I get that in writing and notarized? <laughs> <laughs> will, you, will you sign it for me? I, I just, I loved your speech. It was just perfect. So thank friends. you very much. Um, there's a question. Uh, within the leadership of the atheist, humanist, um, rationalist community, we talk about whether we have a civil rights issue or not. Uh, we... I contend we do have a civil rights situation when atheists Downey, are harmed. Margaret agrees with me on something. Oh, good. So you agree with that? Absolutely. Okay. Um, I think equality for everybody is, in, is inherently a rational position. And as long as we're advocates of reason and rationality, it's going to necessarily be something we fight for, okay. even if we don't do so directly. Okay. And I just want to remind you and, and everyone else that I continue to collect discrimination narratives. I've been doing it for 20 years and my database includes everything from murder to loss of jobs and loss of family. Uh, and I want to continue building that database as proof when we say we are not getting equal civil rights, that we have the evidence to prove it. So see me if you need to report something, and I'm going to give you some forms too. Yeah, Thank uh, you very much. Oh, no problem. I, I, just, I just did a post on a battle the FFRF won. Uh, there's two counties, one in Mississippi, one in Kentucky, that can no longer say sectarian prayers before sporting events. And immediately I got, I got a flood of emails from people saying, you know, oh man, my kid is in sports, and, and they pray Christian prayers all the time. Uh, and it, it's terrible. And I, I wrote them back and said, well, get a recording of it, send it to me. This is my job to, to fix this. And every single one of them said, well, we don't want to make waves because we're worried about the potential consequences of doing so. You know, we, they don't want to lose their position on varsity. And so it's one thing to say we have the law on our side because almost all the time we do. But it's a completely other thing to say that we can do it safely because more often than not, we can't. And that's the atmosphere I want to change. I want to convince other people to change. Uh, and frankly, as Maria knows, to be brave enough to change because it's Getting hard. Yes, ma'am. Hey, JT. Hi. My question is, do you have any specific suggestions for when you're engaging someone? And I've noticed this is true of any belief system, not just religion, but mm -hmm. anti-vaxxers, 9-11 truthers, 12-steppers. As soon as you state your position, their defense wall goes up. Just mm -hmm. And it's almost like you were saying, nah, -uh, nah, -uh. uh -huh. So, what are some suggestions that I um, might could use to kind of, because uh, gotcha. it's, it's hard to even get the conversation started with mm -hmm. some people when they're so defensive. For those of you who went to TAM uh, and saw the panel with PZ Myers, you know he got asked, how many emails per month do you get from people saying you've changed their mind? And it was something like hundreds. Um, but that's always the way it works. Very seldomly 
do we change anybody's mind at the time? And a lot of atheists will say, that's where we get this, you know, you'll never change anybody's mind type of outset, because we can't change their minds at the time. It very rarely happens. But obviously, when you saw the hand raising exercise earlier, we are changing people's minds. And it's always a couple months down the line when those ideas have had the chance to percolate in their minds and they've, had, you know, and they've lost sleep over it, that then they write you and say, hey, you changed my mind, thank you. So what I would say is, you're, especially as nice as I know you are, don't change anything. Just realize that you're not out to get their minds then. And you may not even be out to get their minds, because if you're doing it in public and doing it in front of a group or putting it online, what well, you may not change their minds, you may change, change the minds of people watching. So just know that you're, you're gunning for an effect down the line. So right? just plant the seed and be plant patient. Plant the seeds. Nobody, nobody changes, their, changes people's minds at the time generally, whether they're completely diplomatic or completely firebrand. You know, it, it's always a, a time-consuming process. Thank you. So just keep your chin up. Okay, we have four and a half minutes left. Lightning round. Go. Sorry about that, JT. Um, oh, no I, uh, first of all, you remind me of Sam Harris with better delivery. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sam Harris was what got was was what convinced me that I needed to be more passionate about atheism. He's one of my heroes. That means actually a lot to me. Thank you. Okay. Christopher Hitchens did it for me. But um, my question regards the uh, internal atheism. I'm on a online group on Facebook and how do we deal with the bigotry within our own sect sect um, basically with you you said mockery earlier a lot of us new atheists as opposed to engaging in the arguments are more on the well you're an idiot you believe in sky fairies wizards yes. blah 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 etc instead of focusing on the issues um, there are people in our movement who mock for the sake of mocking um, and even though I'm uh, in terms of being a firebrand to the left of P.Z. Myers, um, I don't think that's a good idea. There always needs to be a point along with it. And how do we deal with that? It's negative, but it's not as negative as you'd think. Those people drive religious people uh, into the arms of the more diplomatic atheists, which is why we need them. I'll be the first to say that we need the diplomatic atheists. I would never want to be one because I would suck at it, but we need them. Um, so as far as dealing with them, there's honestly not much you can do. Um, but just accept, be the atheist who in the religious person says, oh God, they're such jerks, be like, yeah, I know, but hey, look, I'm a nice atheist, and <laughs> Pascal's wager really does suck a lot. <laughs> you don't have to do like the interpretive dance with it, but you get the idea. Appreciate you. No problem. Thunderfoot lookalike, go. Yeah. Uh, I like to say uh, I go to Mississippi State cool. University. I manned and asked an atheist table this spring, and... Awesome. I'd like to say, deep in the south of Mississippi, we did not get any angry people. We got a bunch of people that were willing to just talk. So what you're suggesting definitely works. Awesome. Uh, I was going to say, I just wanted to kind of give that out. My question is very pointed. I was going to say, that'd be the best question ever. Good. <laughs> <laughs> My question is very pointed, but it's something I run into a lot in the south, is you hear this phrase, and when it's pointed at you, how do you respond? I'll pray for you. If God can't do anything for the multitudes of starving people in the world praying, he can't do shit for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> Wonderful talk. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, great point that uh, we that atheists need to come out. Um, but uh, I'm rem I remember in the civil rights movement, one of the critical elements where there were people who weren't brown driving down to Mississippi and standing up for people. And uh, in the gay rights movement, there are people who weren't gay out there marching. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to that? Uh, the people who aren't gay standing up for gay people? Or the people who are not skeptical, are not skeptical standing up for us? Um, I think you're 100% right there so far. But I think the, the difference that's important to note there is that those are, uh, you know, being gay, being uh, uh, not Caucasian, are just ways that you're born. Ideas are not that. Ideas are something that can be changed and something that should be scrutinized. Now, it's true that ideas barricade themselves within the minds of well-meaning people. That is true. And sometimes they will stand up for us. But if we're going to say reason is important. Not just atheism, but reason is important. How can a religious person be our ally on that front? There are a lot of fronts they can be our ally on, but in the quest for reason, how? I mean, if you've got an idea, let me know. 
Does that make sense? This is Amanda Kneef. She is a lobbyist for the Secular Coalition for America, and she is quite possibly the biggest badass in the secular movement, and I do not say that lightly. Well, now you make me feel bad because I came to hijack your mic and the end of your presentation. <laughs> I'm going to let you finish in a minute, but <laughs> Sam Harris has the best book on atheism. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to say I always love hearing you talk and it's great to see you again and I wanted to let everyone know there have been a lot of uh, points brought up about um, how we bring skeptics and atheists together. Also, if you're not an atheist, how do you support the movement? I call you a secular ally. My mom is a secular ally and I'm going to be giving a talk here at 10 a.m. on Sunday just about that topic <laughs> and I'd love to see all of you here. So if you can rouse yourself after uh, Saturday night's wonderful activities, I'd love to see you here and we can have a great debate about it. Going back to what you said when he said, it says end, but I'm going to go and throw this one thing out real quick. I don't want to act like religious people cannot be our allies on every front. They can. And we, and we should welcome them. But we shouldn't let the fact that they can be our allies on other fronts obscure the fact that we still need to be, we, we still need to treat ideas like they matter and that reason is important. Guys, thank you so much for coming. I'm really flattered that all of you came. Thank you so much.